Yeah? Okay. So uh, let me introduce to you uh, our lecturer, Professor Tian Feng Lu. Um, the, uh, you know, we've been offering this summer school for a number of years, and uh, all along we have this combustion chemistry, right? That's the foundation course. But this year, you, you notice we have sort of more, more advanced level of combustion chemistry with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Klippenstein and now Professor Tian Feng Lu. Uh, what he's going to say that uh, I was just thinking, you know, I always like to think in terms of history and in terms of future. Right? <laughs> you, you feel starting from the 1980s and 1990s, there's all the development of reaction mechanisms, right? To, 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 to take care of the chemistry in, in, in the computations. Now, then there are two major challenges in, in this. Now, I don't know, he might say more of this, but just from my own viewpoint. Uh, one is that the mechanism just gets bigger and bigger, 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 incredibly bigger. So at a certain point, you say, well, what? There's no way. I mean, you, you, I can do it so very, OK, I can do the chemistry very accurately, whatever, but I cannot use it, right? Because the computer cannot handle it. So that's one thing. The, the, the other challenge is, is that just like any kind of CFD, you guys remember that, any kind of CSD, CFD, you get all the data, you get the calculations coming out. How do you milk out the physics? Right? You, you get all the numbers, then what? What do you learn from it? Huh? Right? Because ultimately, there are two things. You learn something from it, you use it to, you know, to, to do some design improvements or something like that. But even to do the design improvement, you have to get the, the physics out of it. Huh? So, so what uh, Professor Tian Feng Lu has really contributed significantly to both aspects. One is called develop systematic, de develop systematic ways to reduce mechanism. Right? His directed relation graph method is probably among the most uh, most uh, advanced uh, advanced uh, approach still is in, in 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 reducing it, and then then his uh, computational diagnostics basically get all the data. How do you get the physics out of it? Just do the calculations. Okay. So those are the and, and then the other 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 things. Then he's a real smart guy. I can I, I know him for a long time, so I I can. Testify. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so well. Without further ado, I'm I'm just so very pleased to to have him to here to to give you guys uh, knowledge. Okay. Okay. Thank thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Long. <laughs> so so first of all, could could you hear me well in the back? Okay, great. Uh, so before, before I, I move on to the real stuff, uh, could you let me know how many of you were in the one hour morning lecture? Oh, most of you guys, good, good. So uh, I do have a few slides in the beginning which is overlaps with that one. So I can do a little bit faster for the introduction part or just talk a little bit something else, okay. Uh, so here is briefly the outline for uh, the whole talk today and tomorrow. So basically, uh, if you look at this, there are two major portions, uh, as you can see from the title. So one is on um, mechanism reduction. One is uh, uh, for the developed, deve development of advanced chemistry solvers. Uh, so the, the major purpose of this, of course, is to speed up the calculation. So that's uh, one. Secondly, uh, if you get a smaller model, uh, it can help you to extract just clear information from simulation result. So rather than looking at the massive outlet, uh, output for, for simulation result, so you just need to look at a small data set. So it's a lot easier to work on a small data set rather, rather than the huge ones today. Okay. Uh, so, so here are the, the major methodologies I will mention. So most of this method, I will just talk briefly uh, uh, so I, I know you guys uh, all are kind of um, maybe energy or drained a little bit uh, pro approaching the end of this week. And also for afternoon lectures, probably uh, you used half or maybe some of a major portion of your energy. So I'll keep this uh, uh, talk in the afternoon. Uh, so more of 
philosophical, <laughs> so, rather than just uh, uh, giving you a lot of uh, mathematical equations. Uh, just try to make it uh, light, so you, you can you can just focus on ideas and also the the, the basic concepts as of what we are doing. Uh, actually, through many years of research, my, my major major uh, feeling so I, I gained from this research is not not a particular method. So it's not that that important. It's just develop one or two. A specific method, but actually what, what you can learn from this process. I find a lot of these this topics when I work on it, uh, there are a lot of simil similarities or analogy you can find through how to, how to, how to uh, also how, how you can do other things, like uh, in terms of make, uh, just being a human being, and also uh, just a lot of societal issues. Actually, it, you, it bears a lot of similarities to this uh, model reduction stuff, uh, as I will uh, show you later. Okay, uh, so in, for the advanced chemistry solver, advanced chemistry solver it sounds to be a little, little bit more mathematical. So I will, I will just roughly describe what happens for the equations, and then uh, you try not to focus on on the on the equation, the math itself. Try to th think of uh, uh, how to deal with new problems, okay? Because uh, you know, uh, we the combustion field have been evolving for many decades, right? Uh, you know, we we get sometimes easy problem to solve, sometimes not that difficult problem to solve. Sometimes you get a very difficult problems, right? Uh, so particular for some particular uh, methodologies, so people have been used the if. If it has been used in the past decades, the chances uh, the easy problems to be solved are already solved. So we are dealing with a more difficult problem. So to make analogy to the chemical kinetics uh, society, we are talk talking about this activation energy. Okay, those problems has much higher energy barrier. If you want to solve these problems, uh, the chances if you use old methodology, old ways of thinking. Uh, the, ch the chance to solve it is probably not that good. Okay, uh, as as I said, the simple issues have already been being being tackled. So a lot of the tough problems we do need uh, totally new uh, directions, a totally new methodology, to, totally new tools to solve them. A lot of these issues are quite challenging. Uh, not only in, in, in model reduction, not only in, in stiff chemistry solver development, but also, for example, in turbulent flame simulations, and even in understanding of elementary flame, flame problems. So, uh, ho hopefully, uh, so through this uh, this uh, two days afternoon lecture, uh, I hope you just uh, probably don't just try to remember all these methodologies. Uh, if you can, if you can. Uh, Take home some of the ways how how we think to handle the problem we deal we dealt with before, and probably if it can shed light to your own research, uh, help you to solving totally new problem. You create your own methodology. You use your own approach uh, without any limitation. You, you you get your method. So that will probably be, be most helpful. Okay. Um, so the background, I have shown this in the beginning. So of course, if you look at the, 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 the reason why we want to use detailed chemistry in simulations, it's, it's mostly it's due to this uh, non-monotonic behavior or nonlinear responses of combustion systems. Right? Uh, the combustion systems, over the many years I dealt with it, uh, my feeling is that a combustor, combustor is more, more act, it acts uh, more or less like a very sophisticated person. It's very difficult to predict what they will do. Uh, sometimes if you interact with somebody, you, it's straightforward to see this guy, but combustor is like you deal with some <laughs> sophisticated person uh, full of surprises. Uh, so if you try to use straightforward manner to predict what will happen. So if you see uh, the flame is always homogeneous here, or flame is always burning in a flame lit mode, or flame is always trying to auto-ignite. This kind of straightforward prediction, typically you will see trouble when you want to use this in different burners, different scenarios. Even the same burner at different, uh, different conditions, you, you will see you may, you may have a lot of surprises. 
Okay, so we, we need to pay a lot of respect to the problem we try to, to solve. They are very difficult. Uh, so far, I think this is probably the most difficult one I have been uh, heard about or, is, or saw about. The other field there, I saw a lot of uh, progress made in other, other disciplines. Like, for example, computer science. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, very nice, elegant methodologies was, de was developed. Uh, but in many cases, you find this uh, useful or very powerful method are rather simple, uh, uh, quite straightforward. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you happen to be in a new field, uh, which a lot of new, new opportunity, new problem to solve, you probably find a lot of easy things to solve, right? But in combustion, the chances you find almost every major issue you want to deal with, a thousand people, or at least hundred people, have been dealt, tried to solve it before. Uh, numerous failure has occurred. Uh, there are all different sorts of reasons why we shouldn't work on it, but we have to. So, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, uh, the other the people in, in not in this society will think, "What are you guys are doing here for the 30, 40 years, or 60 years even?" What new, uh, new uh, breakthrough? Uh, what, uh, what new contribution did you guys make to this field? Uh, <laughs> so to answer this question, you do need to solve the new challenges, or in other words, more, more difficult with problem with this higher activation energy, new the higher energy barrier. So, so the requirement for you guys is a lot higher. Uh, for us, okay. So each generation, we we need to solve it's more more and more difficult problems. Uh, so so this is this one shows shows uh, uh, some more detailed problems. So this, as I mentioned, these uh, people are interested in, in this one for uh, ignition applications. For example, compression ignition engines. If you want to put some fuel air mixture uh, to a cylinder, you want to compress ignite it. You want you have to wait till auto ignition occurs because there's no there's no flame in the beginning, right? Um, and this this uh, painfully long process, uh, the so-called auto ignition delay time, uh, actually it has been quite well studied. Because why? Because first of all, it takes a bit of longer time than the other problems. Uh, usually, the time scale for auto ignition in IC engines it's an uh, order for milliseconds. If you if you think. Uh, so your, your car engine, your truck engine, it runs in about an order of uh, several hundred, a thousand RPM. Uh, if you convert it to combustion time, it's order of a few milliseconds, sometimes 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, okay? So it's rather slow. Uh, and, and also, uh, something interesting here is uh, I, I introduced to you guys this S-curve behavior. For ignition, you see this S curve, this ignition turning, the lower turning point. I didn't talk too much about this. Is something you need to worry about. Similarly, with this ignition delay time. So this one with very weak mixing, uh, this one without mixing. But the, the response here is very similar to here. For IC engine community, you, you you will find the major challenge for model reduction or for for using different fuels is you use different fuel in your engine. Uh, you may see a lot of uh, surprises, something unexpected. Uh, for example, if you put a, a wrong fuel in your car, uh, you will find that you, you can possibly have a very bad knocking issue. Your car will be easily be damaged. So, so the, the IC engine is very picky in fuels. Why is that? Because IC engine, if it depends on the ignition property, ignition is somewhere here. If you look at different fuels, hyd hydrogen, of course, we don't directly burn it. But as a reference, if you have a small molecule like propane, similar to methane, ethane, a small molecule has similar behavior. Without, a, without so-called low temperature chemistry, it ignites very difficultly at low temperatures. It takes very long time. So you don't burn methane directly through compression ignition, typically. Okay? Uh, but you, you do large hydrocarbons. So what happens for large hydrocarbons, it, it has a so-called NTC behavior. Uh, that means if you get a lower temperature, it may ignite even faster. So that makes uh, ignition at a low temperature possible uh, at normal engine running conditions. Within a millisecond, 10 millisecond, ignition is possible. Even temperature is only 850, 900 Kelvin. Okay? So to translate to here, so for large hydrocarbons, you will see some kind of behavior like this. 
the resonance time can be close to order of a millisecond if you want to look at it. But the problem is if you try a different fuel, you, you will see the curve are very different. So, so uh, for normal alkanes, cycloalkanes, uh, yeah, so, so you will see the ignition curve, this kind of behavior, or, or this guy, it smears everywhere here. So basically, if you change a different fuel, your ignition delay time, your timing is totally messed up. So it's very difficult to work on different fuels with icing engines. The, as you heard, if you want to add ethanol to gasoline, you can add too much to it. Uh, you have, ethanol is, has a quite, a, quite a comparable property to, to gasoline already. It's still difficult to handle. A lot, uh, if you, you add like I see more than 50% ethanol to it. So the, uh, right now the pra practice is you add less than 10% ethanol to it. So try to dis disturb the, the fuel property as small as possible. <laughs> but if you put some other fuel, for example, if, if you put a, uh, some kind of a, a jet fuel to it, you know, there are all different sorts of jet fuel or, or different diesel fuels. If you happen to put those fuels to your car, you will see terrible responses. Uh, because the different molecular structure, different molecular size will give you totally different response in terms of ignition behaviors. Uh, or in another word, ignition properties or auto-ignition properties are very sensitive to fuel types. Uh, that's probably why in IC engines the people pay most of the attention to ignition delay time. Because timing is probably the number one issue to worry about if you design an engine. A car engine, you want to make its timing right, so explosion or auto, uh, knocking won't happen within the cycle. Okay? Uh, for diesel engine, of course, it's a little bit fine. It's non-premixed burning. Uh, but then you need to worry about this uh, resonance time issue to minimize uh, emissions, NOx emissions, soot emissions. Uh, for HCCI type, you know, on HCCI, HCCI engines, it's premixed. If you try to compress ignite it, you get a whole lot of trouble how to control the simultaneous ignition or very rapid heat release. That can damage the engine, give you very bad knocking. Okay? Sometimes it even give you detonation wave just quickly to destroy the whole, the whole thing. Uh, so therefore, it's a whole lot of trouble to try to design combustor in this area. Uh, that's pretty much is tied, this challenge is tied to how IC engine works. Okay? Uh, but if you look at the upper, upper uh, turning. The upper turning point, if you compare hydrogen, hydrogen, uh, the most permanent observation you can see from here uh, with hydrocarbons, large hydrocarbons, small hydrocarbons, you can see hydrogen uh, is much more difficult to extinguish. The extinction resonance time is almost two orders of magnitude shorter than hydrocarbon fuels, whether it's small or large hydrocarbon fuels. So, so pretty much practically it's not feasible if you want to quench a hydrogen flame. So hydrogen flame, is, if you ignite it, it's always there, uh, propagating. So you can probably wrinkle the flame very badly, but it's very difficult to, to quench it locally or to poke a hole to the hydrogen flame. But hydrocarbon flame burns much weaker because uh, hydrocarbon, and, and also if you look at different fuels, you know, you get a, Iso alkanes, you get a normal alkanes, or even so large molecule propane, uh, uh, small molecule propane versus large molecule biodiesel. You put all these different fuel together. If you look at what happens here, they all collapse to this curve. So that means the extension behavior is not that sensitive to fuel type. So in terms of chemistry, you don't see a lot of different response in terms of this fast burning limit. Uh, with respect to fuel type. So that's why if you design a jet engine, if you are, if you are a gas turbine engineer, a jet engine designer, you probably see less trouble in terms of kinetics to burn different fuels in your combustor. That means the chance you throw in a new fuel to your combustor, it typically can run just as is. You, you can just drop in the fuel. You have a lot of more uh, choices than what you can do with, in, compared with IC engines. Uh, so, so, so therefore, this simplifies the combustor design a lot. But you still have something to worry about that is probably more, more physical-like. If you have physical properties, for example, viscosity, boiling point, if those f physical properties are uh, very different, you, you can still have, have difficulties in, in terms of uh, atomizing the fuel. 
the spray will be totally different. When I drop inside and spray, vaporization will be different. So you, you, you have some issues associated with the physical properties. But the chance is you will see less fuel sensitivity uh, in terms of high temperature combustion. And the high temperature combustion, and also it burns very fast, very fast. As we said, if you bypass the radical explosion stage, uh, the time scale for this fast burning is typically in, in range from microseconds to 10 microseconds. Sometimes in limb blood, it's a good 100 uh, microseconds, or, or maybe even milliseconds. So it's a sub millisecond to microsecond level, uh, typically by order of magnitude faster compared with the ignition turning. Right? This guy is two, three orders of magnitude faster than this turning uh, easily okay, for, for most hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, uh, we do have a lot of different problems to worry about uh, for model reduction. Uh, if you want to get a reduced model for IC engine, uh, you probably won't want to make auto ignition delay time the number one target parameter to, f to be correct right, in your reduced model. So, so that means if you want to use your reduced model in uh, diesel flame simulation or HCTI simulation, if you mess up the ignition delay time, the game is over. That, that's it. Uh, but that doesn't tell you uh, ignition delay time is the only thing relevant in IC engines. For example, take an take example for, for diesel flame. Diesel flame after the, the ignition spot, uh, eventually you will have a strong flame, lifted flame established there, right? And these are strongly burning flames. It's flame propagation it determines the lift off location. And also the trial in the process is what happens there, it determines the emissions, soot emission, NOx emission. If you want to predict emissions from those IC engines, uh, it's, it's, it's almost always not uh, sufficient if you only deal with the ignition delay time in model reduction. Okay. For jet engines, as we said, the model can be much simpler. If you don't deal with ignition delay time, um, at, this, at this turning, as we will show later, the combustion was largely controlled by primary radical pool, H radical, OH radical, and O radicals, and also formation of CO from formula radicals. Uh, Sometimes you can, you can see uh, something related with formaldehyde reactions pop in. But, but typically, it's small molecules controlling this turning. And for different fuels, it's all the same set of reactions, same set of species uh, dictating what happens at this limit, fast burden limit. Okay, so therefore, in the future, if you don't do model reduction, if you if you are assigned a task to design a burner, you probably want to to try to take advantage of this. Okay, this this limit is first of all, you can burn much faster. Your combustor will be small, uh, much smaller volume, but still fast burning rate. You get a l large thrust from this burner. So secondly, y you can be a lot more fuel flexible in terms of choosing the fuel. Your fuel can be from petroleum, uh, it can be from biofuel. You can, you can also throw in this uh, Fisher Tropes fuel, for example. Some of those fuels are, are almost purely uh, isoalkanes, highly branched alkanes. Uh, you, you put them in, you find it doesn't matter much for, for the burning, particularly if the combustor is running in normal condition, stable, strongly burning condition. So that, that's not a sensitive to the fuel. Uh, so so that, that is two examples for, 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 for the typical engine applications. Uh, and we, we covered this one. We, so the, the, the key point for here is uh, the, the number is very important. So for a computer, the fast development for computer power and make it possible for us to do a lot of a computational job that is not possible. Uh, let's see, two, three decades ago. So each decade, computer power increased by a factor of 1,000. So with 1,000 times a faster computer, we supposed should be able to do a lot of fancy stuff uh, if it is limited by computing power, right? So probably the development of uh, detailed chemistry, it's like RMG, what you guys learned in the morning, that, that is probably uh, more or less limited by computing power. So nowadays, um, now, nowadays, so if you think 20, 10, 20 years ago, people make mechanisms all manually, right? You make it by hand. How many species, how many reactions can you put in? You make it lifelong, you can make probably five, 10 big models with a thousand species. That 
you, you can make a, make, make a living for it, right? <laughs> but, but today, if you throw this job to computer, it can quickly speed you speed up a much larger mechanism. Let's see, with even tens of thousands of species within let's see, hours or days or at the most month. So it, it's, it's a different order of magnitude to, to worry about in that case. Okay? Uh, but also, uh, if you think uh, uh, on, on another, <laughs> another side, there's something funny here is uh, uh, I, I had had a lot of chances to, to work together with the industry people, with engine companies. And they always ask me for a reduced model, okay? or sometimes for a, a faster solver. Uh, but, but typically, they don't want solvers because they need to change the code. So that requires a lot of work. So they want uh, some drop-in model. Uh, and so rather than those 1,000 species or several hundred species model, they ask me, can you give me a five species model? And it, do, <laughs> do you guys know what five species mean? That's just one step, right, for hard to cut. <laughs> you get four elements. Uh, so one step. So people have done, done this uh, 30, 40 years ago. Why do you want to ask me for it right now? So 40 years later. So then, then the later they said, how about uh, 10 species? <laughs> I said, the best I can do after 20 years of work on, working on this, I can give you, let's see, for small molecules, I can give you 20 species. For large molecules, I can give you 30, 40 species. That's the best I can do. Uh, <laughs> then, then I almost got mad with them, and they, they went back. The, the funny thing, 10 years later, 10 years later, I still work with these guys. Uh, just like two weeks ago, I went to this, uh, this, this meeting. <laughs> so engine people came on asking me, so could you give us a reduced model with five to 10 species? I thought you asked me this 10 years ago. You get 1,000 times faster computer. Why ask me still 10 species? <laughs> <laughs> These have been bothering me for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> so so from this, this aspect, you can see sometimes uh, the rapid growth in computer power, it may help the problem, and sometimes it doesn't help. Okay. In terms of model reduction, there are some, there are some serious issues here. Uh, it's, it's, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that much uh, how accurate or how large the, the model is, whether it's 20 species versus 40. It, it seems to, to be a similar size to me, right? Uh, but it makes a huge difference to the, to the industry people. It's a yes or no problem to them. They say, I can accept no more than 15 species, period. So, <laughs> so you can see that the, the challenge. I spent 20 years work on this. I give you. 30, 40 species model, that's the best I can do. You guys work on this, you need to sanctify the industry people because that's eventually when, how people will use it. Yeah, your, your model will be actually used in engine simulation. You have to deal with, with them to give them five, 10 species. And 10 years later, they may still ask you for 10 species. You know? <laughs> uh, is it more difficult to get a 10 species model? <laughs> you tell me, because I tried everything I can all the fancy methodologies, I can't do it 10 species. Okay? Because you can, you can just use, use, use a few fingers to, to, to number this species is important, that is important. Uh, it's more than, more than 20 species important. <laughs> Easily you can count them. Okay? Uh, so you guys get a, a lot more difficult problem to handle. And this method I will tell you, it won't solve the issue, but you will think of your own method to, to solve it. If you later you will, you, you, want to, you want the engine people to use your model. <laughs> so my feeling is 10 years later, they will still ask you for 10 species. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this one, we, we saw it again. So this figure shows, shows the statistical size of different detailed mechanisms. Uh, number of reactions in log scale versus number of species in log scale. So, uh, as you can see, the number of species, number of reactions are roughly linearly correlated. So the correlation is roughly number of reactions is five times number of uh, species. So if the reactions are reversible, if it's not, if you open the direction, so that'll be ten. So uh, ten one-way uh, reactions. Okay. So uh, if if it's a irreversible reaction, so this number will be, become roughly ten, and uh, also. Uh, as you can see, for larger, larger molecules, this is hydrogen, methane, ethylene, ethane, 
uh, then gasoline fuel, diesel fuel, biodiesel fuel, so it's getting larger and larger in the log scale plot. So if you want to deal with the real engine fuels, it's all somewhere in this regime with several hundreds to several thousand species. So when Professor Green's RMG software is ready to use, you will probably need to deal with somewhere in this regime, okay? Um, <laughs> So with, with 10,000 species or maybe 100,000 species, if that's the case, you will have some serious trouble to, to run any even zero-D simulations. Uh, if you want to compute auto ignition delay time, anybody compute ignition delay time with this guy with 8,000 species? So how much time it roughly take, takes you to get one case down with a second, let's see. A few, a few minutes, or oh, you are using a very good solver. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this one takes me a day or two to get a single solution. So you, you can get a few minutes for these guys. If you get a 1,000 species, uh, or a few hundred, a few hundred species, that is about an order of minutes. But the Kempkin 2 solvers, if you, if you do the timing, you will find the cost in this, in this uh, limit, la large limit number of species. The cost is a cubic function of number of species. So that means if the size of the model increased by a factor of 10, it's 1,000 times more com consuming. So I, I was put on some simple equation to show why it, it scales like n cube in large limit. It's pretty much depend on the Jacobian matrix. Okay. So, so obviously we see a lot of need to do the model reduction. Uh, in this, in, in, in for these fuels, for these practical fuels. So, uh, so, so ne next, then let's look into it, to the how to do a model reduction. So be before we can come up with a concrete solution, we do need to look at the problem to see where, where the challenges are, are right? So what is the uh, most difficult, or what, is, what issues need to be addressed? for the reduction part. So if you look at a, a whatever flame simulation, uh, let's see a reactive diffusive system, uh, or with convection terms, uh, in turbulence or in laminar situation. So you can always write down the governing equation like th this, right? So if you follow a fluid element, so this is a material derivative uh, of a vector of uh, dependent variables, let's see temperature, pressure, species concentrations, uh, this, this state variable chain uh, can be uh, attributed to chemical reaction source term, of course. I just use omega to denote chemical rea reaction source term. And also diffusion term. Different scalars will have different diffusivity, but if you put it in, you will get a, the, the diffusion term. Uh, this, this guy is so-called convection term. The convection term, sometimes you put together with diffusion term, people call it mixing term. Uh, so chemistry mixing, that's two major portion people are handling in CFD simulations. Mm, so to solve, this, to solve this equation for a multi-dimensional flow, the first step, of course, to do numerical discretization. Uh, you, you, uh, you, know, you use, for example, finite difference method to divide this, the domain to many grid points. Right? You all know this finite difference method. So it's developed several hundred years ago, the concept, uh, much earlier than we have a computer. So, but to seriously use finite difference in the extreme scale flame simulations, it's just uh, become serious in the recent 10, 20 years. Okay. Uh, we can deal with really 3D simulations with, 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 with billions of grid points, for example, to get the, the required accuracy to, to resolve the field. Uh, let, let's see, suppose you get a mesh grid already there, and then so the equation was discretized on to just different uh, grid points. So as the equation then become from partial differential equation to an ordinary differ differential equation, you get a, rather than a set of ODEs to solve, we are solving a big set of PD, uh, rather than solving a, uh, a set of PDEs, you are solving a, a large set of ODEs, right? Ordinary differential equation. Everything is just a function of time because the time is, is dy dt. Uh, so everything else goes to the right hand side after discretization. Okay? Uh, and then if you, if you want to solve this problem, uh, you find all the, all the variables, uh, all the grid points are somewhat coupled. 
Uh, if you want to get a solution on this grid point, you need to know the neighbors because they are all coupled together. So how do you solve this issue? Uh, it turns out that you have to solve the entire field all simultaneously, together, all together. Uh, to solve this all together is very challenging because you get two options. Okay? Uh, if you have been working on OD solvers before, one way is to solve the problem use so-called explicit scheme. You know? The other way is called, called implicit scheme. I guess you all know the difference between the two, right? Explicit scheme is to do the rate evaluation based on the current or available solution. So the current step, you know the concentrations, you know temperature, whatever, and you put it in, you know the reaction rate. And then multiply delta T, you know what happens at the next highest step. So the solution is marched step by step, explicit. You don't need to do iterations, whatever. Uh, but for stiff issues, for stiff issues, eh, <laughs> it's very tricky to use explicit solvers for reacting flows. Uh, stiff is, stiffness means you get a, something very fast, but other processes are much slower. If you want to take care of all of them, uh, the time step you need to take was limited by the fast guys. In chemical reaction systems, the fast time scales, you know, how, how fast it can be in your experience. One minus uh, Second, right? Yeah, so what's the guy giving you this short time scale, for example? What, what species typically can give you such kind of a short time scale? H, H, H. H yeah, the, uh, the primary radical, primary radicals like H, O, A, H has a rather, H has rather long time scale. H, H, the reaction time scale for H is, let's see, microseconds or sub-microseconds. Uh, OH is a lot faster. OH and O is a lot faster. It's, it's more reactive, okay? Those can go uh, nanosecond level or several nanoseconds. So the primary radical, radicals are not as big troublemakers. Sometimes if you look at an HCO radical, uh, a kidney radical in a lot of cases, just, uh, if you deal with C2 chemistry, you, you will find a lot of this, this, this C1, C2 radicals that can give you very short time, very short time, sub, sub nanosecond. Uh, and sometimes if you deal with uh, large hard carbon fields, uh, you, you know that's just uh, activated states, right? So we just covered this in the morning lecture. It's activated states, uh, it can quickly, you know, you get a one electron here, it can jump here and there. It's a radical position can, can, can jump around. Uh, you get isomers, which can, can have terribly short time scale to, to do the isomerization. So sometimes if you deal with uh, Lawrence Livermore's 3,000 species mechanism, you find time scale very short, or physically short even. Uh, in some cases, you find the time even shorter than femtosecond. It, it, it's, just, it's just too short. There's no, no such possibility that you can use femtosecond to do your time integration for flames, right? As we said, for engine combustion, engine combustion the interesting phenomena, heat release, typically occurs in order of a millisecond for IC engines, okay? Or tens or hundreds of microseconds for jet engines. That's a typical time scale. So you typically use a little bit shorter time to, to resolve the whole process, heat release process. That's why in CFD, uh, you use as much as like the longest one, probably, if you are serious with CFD, you use a microsecond time step. That's, you already feel, oh, it's too large. You will start feeling some, you worry about it. One micro second, okay? If you want to do large eddy simulation, oh yes, uh, it's probably 0.1 microsecond sometimes. Or uh, sometimes people do 50, 60 nanoseconds. The, the consider is, oh, this is already very short. 50 nanoseconds, you know, uh, 10 to the negative seven, uh, no, 10 to the net, t between 10 to the negative 8 and 10 to the negative 7, that's all still much larger than, than, than the radical time scale, scale, right? For DNS, if you look at Jackie Chan's DNS, she, do, she, she does uh, how much? She does 10 nanosecond for small fuels, or, or sometime order for nanosecond. Nanosecond time step. That's pretty much the shortest one people can afford in today's state of art DNS. Uh, if you get something shorter than 10 to the negative 9, uh, that means the game is over. You have to use the so-called implicit solver. Uh, 
because the explicit source, explicit server, it will diverge. Uh, but you all know why why it diverges, right? Explicit servers. Explicit server. Let me just give you a sketch. Maybe then you you will quickly know why it diverges. Where is this? Yeah. Huh. I lost a window somehow. Yeah. Let me just just bring out this. Uh, Weird. Somehow the window is closed automatically by itself. Just just a sketch. All right. When when you do a do a simulation, you try to resolve what happens here, like like this. Something changes with time, right? You, you see, this time is a quantity. Uh, you do a time step. You don't want surprises to happen. If things behave nicely, you you just do this time step. For here, you get a slope. And you will predict next time it landed somewhere nearby. This is perfectly nice, right? If you get a stiff problem, let's see, some radical can respond very quickly. That means uh, if you get a little bit of error here, this guy will try to jump down quickly to the trajectory and then follow this guy. So I will talk about this, this later. So you, let me just blow up a little bit, okay? So suppose you, you have a trajectory jump, jumping down within a very short period, okay? Uh, if, if you use the current, current rate to evaluate this, you will get a slope like this. This is your slope, right? With this type, delta D time, if you, next time you will end up with somewhere here. All right. Uh, and then if you say this, this, this radical condition is already much, much worsely predicted, so you try to jump back to this location quickly, right? And then you get a slope like this. And the next, next time step, it just goes nowhere. So after a few time steps, it just diverges exponentially. Because the, the whole thing is uh, something can give you a, like a boundary layer, like very short, thin layer. And this rate is useless. You cannot use this rate to evaluate what happens after a large step. Because this nonlinear process, you just cannot use a linear, linear expectation to predict what happens to it next, right? And then, uh, if the explicit solver doesn't work, you have to switch to implicit solver. What happened to implicit solver is you don't use this rate. You know this rate is garbage, it's useless. Then uh, what can you use? You try to find something iteratively at this location. You find somewhere nearby, give you a, give you a, a kind of a slope, which makes sense. And then you use that condition as a slope. So, but what is this concentration A is? You don't know. Uh, so, 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 so you need to solve this through Newton iterations. Okay. Once you use Newton iteration, then eventually you need to evaluate the Jacobian matrix, and we will show later. And you want to do factorization of the Jacobian matrix. It depends on how large the Jacobian A is. But, but let's go back here. Uh, let's Let's go back here. Uh, if you get a, if you, if you, if you, hmm? because uh, I guess this new toy, a lot of unexpected behavior, because <laughs> they have a very small bar here to write on. I guess this is fancy surface pen to write on this. But a lot of operations kind of <laughs> surprising to me. Uh, just bear with me, okay. Uh, if, if, you, if you want to solve the whole fl flow field together with the implicit solver, that's pretty much a lot of people have to do. Uh, you need to solve all the variables, uh, all the grid points simultaneously. You, you imagine how many variables you need to deal with. Suppose you get a million grid points in a, in a moderate case, million grid point. Each grid point, you get a 30 variables. So that will give you 30 million variables, right? So can you do a Gaussian elimination for 30 million by 30 million matrix? There's not, no such possibility you can do it. There's no way you can do it. So, 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 so the only thing you can do, either you, 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 you only narrow down to a 1D problem. You only solve a 1D problem to deal with a band, narrow band matrix. Uh, several hundred grid, grid points, that's pretty much what you can do. Several hundred grid points uh, and a, a tri-diagonal uh, or, or, or a few diagonal uh, matrix, that's all. Okay. But for truly 3D simulation, there's no such a possibility you can solve the full system just through Newton iteration. 
Uh, then what can you do? What can you do? You have to think of something else. Okay. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, the the they are using so-called the the the, the so-called uh, splitting scheme. Have you guys heard about splitting scheme? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you if you do CFD simulation, the chances you are using splitting scheme. Uh, so what splitting scheme is? Splitting scheme is you know you get a couple you get a couple system with reaction source term with mixing term, and you, you can't afford solving all of them together fully implicitly. Then how about we make something different? We make some some two artificial system. One is a reacting system without mixing. The other with uh, uh, with uh, with mixing only without reaction. So you do one step mixing problem. You do one step chemistry problem. You put the solution together. You you hope you will get the, the the right answer, right? Just to make analogies, like uh, you, you, if I collect money from two guys, so you give me five dollar, you give me five dollar, I can collect five dollar from you first, and then another five dollar from you guys, from you. Okay, we'll put together, I get ten dollars. It sounds perfect, right? It sounds perfect, easy. So, if it's such an easy problem, I will tell you, combustion would not be. Difficult at all, so as I said, combustion. The flames are very sophisticated. You f it's full of nonlinear, surprising responses. The, the trouble here is that this guy paid me five dollar, and he looking at how much he paid. He changed his mind. You know, that's why you kind of separate these two processes. So sometimes, sometimes you find this splitting scheme works, and sometimes you find it doesn't work at all. You can get a totally wrong answer with splitting. Uh, so, so it's it, it's a, it's very tricky. Uh, how to solve a multi-dimensional problem accurately. And eventually, if you want to make it a universal valid, the answer is you cannot do splitting. So that's, a, that's a, something bad to say. <laughs> bad news for some of you guys if you are using splitting. I can show you when you almost always certainly get a wrong answer by using splitting. Sometimes you can get a right solution. Sometimes you can Always, always get wrong solutions for some problems, uh, and then we have to develop new solvers. That's that's why we, we I want to sh show you some of the work we did for the second part, solver development. Uh, but to 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 look at that one, we need to look at this some more detailed procedure. How to solve this uh, stiff chemistry problem uh, if you are looking at something like this? If you're looking at something like that, let's let's see G. Suppose in a simple case, G is the only chemical source term. Chemical source term is stiff enough, okay? Uh, because rate controlling reactions, like a heat release, formation of CO is slow. So by the way, you know, formation of CO, formation of CO2 give you major heat release and also formation of water. Okay. Uh, so you have to capture or resolve the heat release. And that's pretty much uh, almost everything people are interested in in some engine designs, if, if you're not talk, uh, talking about emission. If you can capture heat release correctly, that's fine. Uh, so your time scale will, will, will need to resolve the heat release rate. As I said, for CO formation, CO formation, it can be very fast. CO formation can happen within order of uh, 10 microsecond, hyper microsecond. CO2 formation is slow. CO2 formation takes milliseconds to complete. So that's a much slower stage. That's why when you design combustor, if you want, if you want something to complete the reaction to be complete, 95 or 96 or 99 even percent of the fuel are converted to product. So you do need to give you long enough time to, for CO2 to form. That's why most combustor design, the size or the volume of the combustor, is limited by the formation of CO, the slow process. Okay, uh, you need to resolve CO. The CO fast reaction for CO, it in many cases, determine the flame holding issue and also the flame propagation speed. Uh, so because the fast chemistry of CO formation, it does have a lot of to do with the, the trident behaviors for, for the flame zones, reaction zones. Mm, so by the way, CO combination to CO2 happens in many cases, it's in the post-reaction zone, recombination zones. A lot of cases in that case. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this time step for integration, therefore we're talking about this, this integration time step. Let's, let's see, uh, 0.1 microsecond, that's typical. Okay. We will use a lot of uh, time step of 0.1 microsecond in, in the following. Uh, and then 
you get a lot of time scale, which is nanosecond, 0.1 nanosecond, or even picoseconds. If you use Lawrence Livermore <laughs> mechanism, you get a femtosecond time scale there. Uh, so you have to deal with this implicitly. How to do it? So this rate ha has to be evaluated in the future. So future concentration somehow give you a reasonable slope. So this g give you a reasonable slope. Okay. If you solve this equation, uh, this equation is numerically stable, and the accuracy is similar to the forward differentiation. Okay. Uh, but if you look at this, this, this equation, this equation, if you want to solve it, it's an algebraic equation, right? You want to find this, this guy. If you put everything to the right-hand side, so you can call this function of the future solution. So this is unknown. You want to find function of uh, y to be 0. You find the root of this guy. So solving a stiff problem is, is boils down to solving algebraic equations. Similarly, if you want to solve a steady state flame, steady state combustion problem, you also need to deal with Newton solver. It's a similar problem, f, f, f y equal to zero. Okay, so stiff problem, uh, steady state combustion, this is, this is the problem you solve. Uh, almost always, if you want, want to solve chemistry reacting flows, you have to use Newton solvers. The Newton solver basically is, is, is first order Taylor uh, expansion. Uh, for the nonlinear function around the solution. Okay, you just do Taylor expansion. This is partial y, pa partial f, partial y. Uh, this guy is something very, very important. Uh, we call this, what do you guys call this? The Jacobian matrix, right? The Jacobian matrix is probably is, is relevant to 80% uh, of the problems in computational, in computational uh, simulations for combustion problems. So almost every, every issue you are dealing with numerically, you have to deal with Jacobian one way or another, whether it's sensitivity analysis, model reduction, sometimes you do uh, flame simulations, or even just if, if you want to compute a rate parameter, calibrate against the experiment, you want to compute some auto-ignition problems, you also all we, more directly or indirectly, you need to deal with Jacobian matrix. Okay? This is something super important. Uh, in addition to its importance in numerical solution, it also carries a lot of uh, important physical information. If you want to understand what happens locally, uh, actually all the important information locally about the system is embedded in this matrix, this Jacobian matrix. So, so therefore we cannot emphasize less how important this guy is uh, in, in, combustion, in computational combustion problems. All right, well, you will see later what well, Jacobian appears everywhere almost in the following for different purposes. Okay. Uh, but for this purpose, we want to solve, we want to, we want to, we want to solve a linear problem, right? Uh, this Jacobian is here. If you want to solve this guy, you need to inverse it. Uh, it's something like y, and it, it, if you put this to the other side, it's g inverse of Jacobian. So, but inverse of Jacobian, you can do it in many ways. Uh, so most, in most cases, people do, Gaussian elimination, or so-called LU factorization. So that's how you can do it. So basically, uh, the Jacobian is factorized to an upper triangle and, uh, matrix multiplied by a lower triangle uh, uh, matrix. So you can, you can do the solution. If you store the Jacobian or the factorized uh, matrix, you can quickly solve whatever new source terms come into this problem. So Jacobian, therefore, you can reuse it in many cases. Okay, so in numerical solutions, a lot of cases, Jacobian, uh, because it's very difficult to compute, very difficult to factorize, very time consuming, sometimes if you take the time to decompose it, you want to store it and use it for as many times as possible. So, so re reuse it. Uh, <coughs> but then, uh, now look at the solution for this guy. This is linear, linear algebra. Problem, right? So as we said, model reduction, uh, most of this math issues boils down to, to high school mathematics or sophomore mathematics. So it's, it's a, a sophomore, sophomore algebra, uh, linear algebra, and also uh, calculus. That's two major things we use here. So don't, don't be scared if you see equations here. Okay. Uh, to solve this equation, let's see how much time it takes for each operation. Uh, you need to evaluate this 
f term. That's a reaction rate. Okay. Or you need to evaluate Jacobian. How do you need evaluate Jacobian? Or how fast it takes to factorize Jacobian? So let's look at the cost one by one. Uh, here is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a chart that basically shows roughly how much time it takes uh, for each component in the simulation. So we do need to look at these numbers to get some rough idea who you want to pay attention to. Uh, if you want to spend your uh, two years time, <laughs> which term you want to handle. Okay. Uh, you want to handle the most time consuming part. So for example, so first of all you need to compute the reaction rates, right? And then in solving the thing, the right hand side, uh, omega. The reaction rate you always need to compute. How do you compute the reaction rate? You, if you have the concentrations, for each reaction you put in the Arrhenius formulation, it gives you the reaction rate. So that's straightforward. So how much time it takes? It's uh, proportional to how many reactions you have. Each reaction, is, you can consider it takes constant time to evaluate. Right? So therefore, evaluation of rates is straightforward. It's, it's, it, it's linearly proportional to number of reactions. And also, remember, number of reactions is, proper, is, is a linear function of the uh, number of species in the st statistical plot. So therefore, you can also see the rate evaluation is linear proportional to number of species in the mechanisms. So as long as you get a linear function, that's not a big deal. Okay? You get a 10 times larger model, you spend 10 times more on it, that's it. Not too bad. Uh, what if you are dealing with uh, implicit solver. Implicit solver, you need to evaluate Jacobian, compute Jacobian locally. Then here comes the question, how do you compute? How do you compute Jacobian? So have you been computing Jacobian by yourself before? Yeah, two major methodology. One is, use, is to use num numerical perturbation. As we said, Jacobian, let's, let's go back a little bit. Uh, let me move to this one. This, this shows what does Jacobian look like? Okay, Jacobian matrix uh, is it, is it's weird. I change this. It's partial G, partial Y. Okay, uh, basically it gives you a matrix. So for each reaction rate, re omega one, omega two, omega three, the reaction rate of the first species, the i species, the n species, with respect to whatever other species concentration. So it's a, it's a very simple square matrix. Um, <coughs> To compute this one, what you can do is if you do numerical uh, difference or a finite difference, you can perturb one species concentration and to recompute the rate. So if you perturb one species concentration, you recompute all the reaction rates. Then you can get a, you can get a one column of the Jacobian. So for each perturbation, you re-evaluate all the reaction rates and you get a one column. Okay. Uh, and how much time it cost? It's proportional to the number of reactions because each rate evaluation is order i, number of reactions, right? Uh, but for each column, you need to do one perturbation. So how many overall cost it takes? It's it's number of species columns multiplies order i. So therefore, evaluation of Jacobian. Uh, through numerical perturbation, it will give you a quadratic dependence. So it's proportional to number of species squared. It's a quadratic function. Uh, it's very time consuming. If, if you use Kempkin 2 for, for almost all the, the, the mechanism you're dealing with, the chance is the calculation of the Jacobian through numerical perturbation is the most time consuming part in the simulation. And you, you click thinking wait for auto-ignition delay time or, or ignition curve from sinking. For 3,000 species, they give you two hours. So the reason is due to the calculation of the Jacobian. You are waiting for the Jacobian to be computed. That, that's what they are doing, okay? Suppose you get a 10,000 species. <laughs> the, the majority of time is spent is just to wait for this guy. You work for the vision. This is so boring. Can we do this better? Of course, we can do this better. So the, how to do this better is, is not to use numerical differentiation, but we can use analytical derivatives. You know, each reaction rate is a function of y, and the format is given, right? So each reaction rate, you have a fixed format. It's, so if you look at any reaction, a plus b equals c plus d, it involves four species, 
That's it. And the reaction rate, if you, it's only partial omega, partial A, partial omega, partial B, partial omega, partial C, partial D. You got four different entries. That's all. Uh, you can get this number through analytical der derivation. You can derive the solution. And then you can use a derived formula to evaluate what happens there. OK? So if you can, uh, so later I'll, I will show you some more detailed formula about uh, analytic evaluation of Jacobian. But, you, but it's, it's rather straightforward. You, what you do is just uh, you analytically differentiate, analytical di differentiate uh, every individual reaction. So each reaction will give you, let's see, uh, four or five entries in the Jacobian. OK, partial omega, partial A, B. For different reactions, you get different species involved. But each, spe each reaction only couple a few species. So you put I reactions all together. So the total of evaluation you need to do is typically linearly proportional to number of reactions. That's why using analytic Jacobian, it's, first of all, it's more accurate. Okay? In numerical differentiation, sometimes it'll give you totally wrong answers if you're not careful. Uh, and more importantly, it's a lot faster. So rather than this n squared, it gives you linear function. So, so therefore, if you are running 10,000 species model, don't run with Kamigan 2, thinking solver as is. Spend some time to write your own Jacobian solver or, or ask, ask somebody to generate an analytic Jacobian for you. You put it in, uh, you can find a solution faster than just, just click the button to wait for it. Okay, so for a large mechanism, keep in mind, use analytic Jacobian. Don't use numerical perturbation. That's the number one <laughs> trick to save the simulation time. Is it particularly important for, for you guys making detailed chemistry? Because when you make detailed chemistry, you, you need to do this, uh, you need to do this autoignition delay time simulation again and again, right? Uh, iteratively. So if you, if you get this RMG, large mechanisms, uh, those zero, that zero D simulation, it will become the rate, rate limiting time step if you use numerical Jacobian. S very simple trick to use analytic Jacobian will, will reduce the time to linear, okay? And then you look at other, other components. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, how, how about let's take a break and come back. So <laughs> 15 minutes break, let's, let's come back and then talk about the other components, okay.